In terms of format for today's session, each of our panelists will be providing a short presentation and we will follow these up with a question and answer period. Our goal is to provide you with an opportunity to have your questions answered. So if you have a question, please write it down on one of these forms that were provided. When you have your question filled out, go ahead and raise your hand and the form up in the air and a staff member will be by to collect it. So our first presentation will be done by Everett McAllister. Everett. Thank you, Eric. It's good to be here this morning, and I mean that. And the fact that with all the travel challenges coming out of DC, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm also under the weather, so I'm dealing with the cold, but fortunately, I know a good pharmacist. <laughs> okay, there it is. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Larry Wagner for this opportunity. He approached me back in uh, November <coughs> about coming and, and addressing this August group. And I was excited about that because during that invitation, he mentioned a couple of things. He said, uh, I want you to come because it's going to be an exciting opportunity, great group of people to uh, meet, opportunity to talk about PTCB. Now, because of the weather, I think it's important that we move beyond that. And I had some conversations last night with dinner with folks and they were talking about how cold it's been, and it has been cold. So I need us to focus on on that, on that on probably a, a happy spot. Okay. Larry said that we were going south. Now, what he did not mention was that it was south Michigan and not Florida, as I had, as I had envisioned. But I was excited about going to Florida in, uh, in February and not coming to the frozen tummy. <laughs> so as we go through the presentation today, I want you to you know, kind of link back to that, that, that happy spot that you, that you like. And forget about the weather and all those other ills, and I want to make sure that I save time for questions at the, at the end. So when I left D.C., it was, uh, it was snowing, and uh, it was snowing in Detroit. My flight was canceled. That's why I said I'm happy to be here. And so I worked with the airline, and I, I called them, and um, they said, call this number. I called the number, and I called the number. I said, uh, thank you very much. We've had a lot of folks that are calling right now, so it's going to extend the wait. Beep, 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 beep. They hung up on me. <laughs> I said, well, this is not good. So I called back again on the phone for a long time. Then I called the second number, so I had two phones going and my laptop. I said, I need to get here to Detroit, otherwise Larry's going to be dancing for 20 minutes during my presentation. <laughs> that morning when I was leaving, it was, it was starting to snow. And what they said was that, well, for the D.C. area, it's just a dusting of snow, a dusting. I said, well, I told my wife, I said, the last two episodes, the last week and a half, they've been wrong. They've missed the forecast. Um, and so I said, I need to plan for that. And as such, they missed the forecast. Again, it was more, more than a dusting of snow. Flight was delayed by 20 minutes, by an hour, because they had the ice. I'm okay with that because I want the plane to get up um, and land safely. <laughs> and so you, you measure snow by, by inches, but also you look at the impact, the impact of the um, of the snow. And for DC, that's important. If you've ever been to DC and had the, the privilege of, of traveling in the area, commuting, traveling is a chore. And so you don't ask folks, you know, you know, how far is it? The question is. How long did it take to get there, and what time of day are we leaving? And so the, the impact is important when you talk about traveling in D.C. and also about the weather. But I also make a similar comparison for pharmacy technicians. Their impact is, is important. Not necessarily the numbers, but what they do and the growth that we've seen over the, over the years. And so as I go through the presentation, they want to kind of loop back to that, the, the impact and significance of pharmacy technicians. So here's our roadmap I'd like to kind of cover today. Describe briefly the mission of PTCB. What is it that we do? Many of you are very familiar with our organization. So discuss some, some changes that we announced back in 2013. And then kind of set the stage more by describing recent changes within the pharmacy profession, within healthcare, that's, uh, that's, that's impacting the pharmacy technicians. And then describe some, some different roles that you may, may not be aware of that they're, that they're stepping into. And if I do my job correctly, at the end of my presentation, you should be able to answer these very simple three questions. And what has remained stable in the pharm pharmacy profession over the last 10 years? Uh, technicians based as pharmacists, and uh, what particular functions? And then finally, which of the following statements are, are false? Okay, so again, you know, if you want to see the CE credits, you have to make sure that you pay attention. Because I And the answers will be given at the end. Okay, so what about PTC? <laughs> 
PTCB, uh, this January, we, we celebrate our, our 20th anniversary. That's a significant milestone for our, our organization, considering the fact that PTCB has its, its roots in, this, in Michigan and Illinois. I mean, you're aware of that, that uh, PTCB was founded uh, after uh, ASHP and APHA came together with uh, Illinois uh, uh, Council of Health System Pharmacists and MPA. And it's been a, a wonderful relationship. And this past summer, we issued our over a half a million certifications. So if you look at, look at the growth of the organization, the number of technicians that, that we're involved with, that is significant for us. We are headquartered in Washington, D.C. It's a great place to be out there on the National Mall. Opportunity to uh, take, uh, interact with a lot of our elected, uh, elected officials. Our organization is, um, is making great strides. So what about the program? Again, I mentioned a moment ago that the uh, number of certifications since 1995. That's a, that's a, that's a big number. Uh, currently, we have over 280,000 technicians that are certified. We are not a leadership organization, but because of the number of technicians that we have involved in our organization, we are sometimes viewed by default as a as representative. So we try to do our best whenever I'm out there to kind of raise issues and concerns for pharmacy technicians. It's a, um, when you describe our exam, it's psychometrically sound. That's a term that um, three, three years ago I was not familiar with. When I came into the job, I had done education and training, but psychometrics was something I had not done. And um, it's not an easy thing putting together an exam. Some folks think, well, how hard can it be to come up with questions? Well, when you're trying to establish validity and make sure that from exam to exam and, 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 that, and assuring the, the knowledge of uh, competencies of individuals, it requires a science. I think back to the times when I took my, um, I sat for my pharmacy exam many years ago. I think it was two days long. It was, it was, it was grueling. It was painful. We don't want to do that again. Uh, but through psychometrics, you actually could um, shorten that down and within uh, within hours and get a good feel for us uh, by the individual. The sit for our, our exam was required that uh, matter of uh, high school diploma or equivalent of GED. Disclosure of all criminal and uh, State Board of Pharmacy Actions. If, I, if you don't do that, Kim will talk to you about some of the consequences of not disclosing that information. Uh, a passing score on the exam, and then if you want to maintain a certification, which you should, every two years, you have to complete 20 hours of CE. Okay, just a little bit on, on the assessment process. I'm not gonna walk you through this, because I tell you, uh, again, it's, having, having witnessed this, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident and very pleased with the work that I've our certain council, what they do in, in terms of putting together an exam, every three months we put together a new form, a new exam. Now this starts with doing a job analysis. About every five years we, we go out and we, we survey the career field and ask, what are you doing? And the last one we've done, we've done it was significant growth in, in that. So we ended up changing our, our test blueprint or exam, the areas that we look at, we went from three to nine domains because of the growth in pharmacy technicians. We had, we had a tremendous response rate. 25,000 individuals responded to that call. So again, we feel good about the information that we, that we received. And so that job analysis provides, again, the foundation for our exam. And as a result of that, we updated our exam in 2013. It's, uh, it's much, more, much more comprehensive, and it covers the entire scope of practice. Not just, some folks say, well, it's just, it's just hospital. No, it's, it's hospital, retail, all the different tasks that technicians are involved in, that's part of that, part of that exam. Okay, why are technicians so important? I think you all know the answer to that question already. When we look at, uh, look at what, uh, what goes on in the pharmacy, technicians are, are crucial. I don't know if a pharmacist that would say, I don't need a, pharmacist, a technician working with me. Most of them say, if the technician does not show up, what am I going to do today? Um, somebody help me. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, so they're an integral part of the operation, and they've proven that they're very competent, and so we need well-qualified technicians to help the delivery system. Medication systems are much more complex than they were 30 years ago. If you look at the drugs that were there, and now we're looking at today. Um, so it's, it's important that we have individuals that are able to assist in the work fulfillment for our, for our patients. And the, the, the role of the technicians, as we look forward, I think will continue to be instrumental in advancing the role of pharmacists. With that, one of the challenges that we have is that there is no national standard when it comes to pharmacy technicians. Education, training, certification, licensure, we're all over the board. When I'm out and about talking to folks, they'll ask, so what's, what's happening in my state? I said, wait a minute, let me pull up my spreadsheet. 
it's almost like an NFL playbook because it's just that vast. We, we vary. I didn't include the maps this, this year showing you what's happening, but when we look at tech ratios, everybody's different. Some states have no ratios, some have one to one, one to four, one to six. If you're certified, non certified, if it's uh, working in a hospital, if you work in a retail store, they're all different. To include you know, what education requirements, you know, do, can I be hired right out, of the, right out of high school, on the job training, or must I go to school and have uh, be a graduate of social training program? So there is no uniform standard when it comes to pharmacy technicians, which in and of, in and of itself sometimes poses a challenge. So one of the things that's important that, that, we, that we consider is developing a scope of practice for pharmacy technicians. Education programs, I mentioned a moment ago that there's no standard there when it comes to that. But also we look at education programs that are there because there is no standard, then we have a, a huge array. So there are 750 programs out there. Now that, they run the gamut from a test prep program that's about a couple days to certificate or diploma program. And oftentimes people, when they think about the programs, they say, well, you have graduate program, they lump all those together, which is not fair for those programs that are, that are accredited and those folks that are doing a really good job. And also one of the challenges that we have out there with some of the training programs, it's, uh, it's, it's an ex it is an expensive endeavor. Uh, some of the private schools, it's up to $20,000 for an individual. And that's going to be important when I can talk about the, uh, the slide in just a bit. ASHP, the last um, at their last count, there are 270 accredited programs. And so if I would compare pharmacy to similar occupations in terms of their requirements, you'll notice that, say, if you're lab tech or radiology, you must have some, some specific training requirements in order to do the profession. But in pharmacy, that's not the case today. The career in terms of, in terms of pay, now these numbers have not been updated. We're waiting for the Bureau of Labor Statistics to update the numbers. But in 2012, the average pay was about $14 an hour. Again, that, that would depend upon where you practice. If you were in a hospital, you might pay a little more. The number of years of experience, some employers pay more if you're certified or if you have uh, more, more education. Job, I'll look in terms of the number of jobs that are out there, about 355,000 <coughs> positions. Now, when I look at the number of NADP, they say, and this is one of the challenges that we have as well, is that there may be, there may be 480,000 technicians. But because some states don't register technicians, we don't know what the, the number is, but that's what's been reported. The promising thing about this, though, is the growth rate for pharmacy technicians. And over this 10-year span, we're looking at a 20% growth rate in the number of jobs. <coughs> Resulting about 70,000 jobs over the next 10 years, compared to some other occupations. So again, that's a that's why you see a lot of advertising for pharmacy technicians, because uh, I think they recognize that this is a growth a growth industry. I talked about when I first started. When I first started um, with pharmacy, my automation, my keyboard was a typewriter. Now, some of you have never seen a typewriter. Uh, <laughs> But it was, it was a typewriter, and the, my printer was the roller. And the, and the most important tool in the pharmacy was a dental paper for when the labels got stuck in the, in the printer. <laughs> it wasn't a spatula, it was a dental paper. Um, and our patient profile system was the back of the prescription. You came in, you recorded the information that patients received, refill us on the back of the prescription. We did not have computers when I started, and uh, I'm dating myself. But uh, that, that, was, that was the case, and so we look at where we are today. There's been tremendous improvements and advancements in, in technology and automation, you know, with, with barcode technology, digital imagery, the, the ability to, 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 to e-prescribe or send prescriptions over the, the ethernet. That's, that's important, the idea of robotics to help with the order fulfillment and distribution of drugs, increasing efficiency and also at the same time improving the accuracy of uh, medication, dispensing. Working in remote areas. Um, before telepharmacy might have been, okay, uh, I'm going to send, I'm going to send my, my technician in a car to go to move these drugs. But there are some areas where it's difficult to get to. Uh, and so having telepharmacy allows you to be able to deliver health care in those remote areas, like the upper peninsula of, of, of Michigan, or out the outskirts of North Dakota. For a while, I lived in Texas, and uh, you could go miles and not see anybody other than tumbleweeds and cattle. The education of the job market has also changed over the years. And we've also seen a change with globalization, the impact of uh, consolidation by, by drug companies, what that means for the profession. You have less of those, and so now what you've all seen is because of that, an increase in generic costs, because there's less competition that's, that's occurring. So 
over the course of the change, it's, it's driving other changes as well. In order for a pharmacy, I think, to remain relevant, I think, um, I think competitive, it means that refocusing how we do things. Whether or not we put pharmacists in the part of the medical home team, helping to assist farmers, help, help, helping to assist physicians, and other healthcare providers in, the, in treating that patient. That's a, an important piece. And it's been recognized now that pharmacists bring a great deal of talent and expertise to the table. When you look at the education sometimes of, that received by nurses and, and pharmacists, and, excuse me, physicians, it's important. We are the, 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 drug, expert, the drug experts. Access to care. It's important that when we, when we talk about the cost of, of care, it's also it's important to talk about the, the access to care as well as making sure that the, the patients are compliant with therapy because it is expensive. Um, it, is, it is an expensive endeavor. Reimbursement rates are, are declining. Those of you who are practicing know this. Uh, which uh, is <coughs> not the same as you got five years ago. So it becomes a challenge of keeping the lights on. So the profession is under pressure to change, to, to, to remain, again, relevant and competitive in that environment. So it means rethinking how we do certain things, how we the model. You know, do we look at central field? I'm not advocating that, but do we look at central field? You know, where should the pharmacist be in the dispensing process? What role should technicians have? All part of those, those are all, I think, important questions that, that have to be, be answered. And the big thing now that organizations are pushing for is provider status. Having pharmacists as part of that list when I was with, uh, with DOD, we, uh, we approached our lawyers and said, we want to be able to do this in, in, in terms of having vaccinations available for our, our beneficiaries, our 9 point eight beneficiaries. And they said, well, it's easy to do. We'll simply go there and we'll write it in. I said, really? That's all you got to do, just write it in. Um, well, it wasn't that simple. Um, and so that's why we have, we've got this big initiative now, I think, to, to ensure that um, pharmacists are recognized and giving, uh, giving that provider status. Not just, I think, for being able to think to build, but also can be able to having that universal sort of acceptance and utilization across all spectrums. So we've talked about pharmacists practicing at the top of the license. You can't do that absent of also looking at the technicians because if, as you move one forward, you have a gap there. And technicians have to step into that role. So as the roles of pharmacists uh, change, as they do more direct patient care, more hands-on patient care, more, more clinical care, te technicians are, are there waiting to, to step in, into the fold. They play, a, they play an integral role in our practice setting. So what about some of the, what about some of the roles that technicians are involved in? A couple of years ago, we did our, we had our first uh, PTCB Tech of the Year. And our two finalists, we're, we're very, actually all the, all the folks were, were very impressive. But two of the finalists, they were responsible for leading 30 to 60 technicians, overseeing those number of technicians. In the past, that would have been a job that a pharmacist would have done. But now you have farm, you have technicians that are that are that are leading, training, supervising other technicians. That's that's impressive. They're also involved in another, another excuse me, a number of other areas, compliance, whether they're making sure that your institution is compliant with Joint Commission or AAAHC, or any other standards out there, creating bodies that, that you may be involved with. They are instrumental in, in surveying, surveying the scene. Be able to go out on teams with the, with the boards and inspect it. We even have technicians that are sit on boards of pharmacy. In North Dakota, the, the president of the board is a technician. Um, so again, you know, we look back over the over the course, like when I started, we didn't use the word technician. They were called clerks or assistants. But now we, we've embraced the, the, that term as well as the role of pharmacy technicians. The immunization assistants, they aren't providing immunizations, but they all this a lot of support that goes into to doing that. And so they've, they've, um, they've stepped into that role. Supply chain management, or procurement. So I have the show, you can't fill the script. And so they do that, do that job for you. Informatics, maintaining all those, all those fancy pieces of equipment that you have, the, the, the robotics, the automation, the script process. Uh, they're there where they're helping to with the database management, writing code. Um, or, or just maintaining the system for you. Um, and MTM, there, if you look at MTM and transitions of care, that's kind of the big buzzword these days, because again, that's an area that when patients, it's unfortunate that patients are, are, are tuned up to discharge, and then what happens once they leave the hospital? There's, there's a gap. I had a conversation with my father the, the other day who was, uh, who was in the hospital over the holidays, and I was asking him questions. And, um, 
I looked at the table. He said, you got a lot of medication on the table. How, how are you doing all this? He said, well, you know, I, I, I do this and that. I said, well, where's your nurse? Well, I don't really think I need a nurse. I said, oh, OK. So you were, admit, you were readmitted in December because you didn't think you needed other things as well. And so I think what the pharmacists and technicians follow the follow care has proven very beneficial. So if you go back and look at the literature, you'll see uh, a lot of evidence to support you there. And then tech, check, tech. Those of you who are in health systems, you are, you've been doing this since, since the late 90s. But this does not exist, for the most part, in community pharmacy. In Iowa, there's a demonstration project going on where technicians are doing tech, check, tech on refills. Pharmacists are removed from that process. The, the goal is here is to determine, you know, if this is a viable process, how safe is it, and does this allow, does this free up the pharmacist to do other things? Again, more direct patient care. They're, they're in phase two of the demonstration project. Uh, the recent, uh, recently, the large change joined Target, Walmart, Walgreens. So we are we are curious to see where this where this goes. But you know, based upon what's happened in the past, if we will be on the politics. I think you know to show that this is a is a is a process that will that will work. So uh, finally, close with a couple of things. We're talking about some recent changes to our program. Back in 2013, I came on board with PTCB, been now almost three years, and looked at what happened, uh, where where the profession was going, where technicians needed to go, and look at and looked at our program. So we need to make sure that we continue to raise the bar to keep in lockstep. To make sure again that we are assessing or managing or assessing the right things. So over the course of seven years, we realized that uh, some things you simply can't do overnight. Over the course of seven years, we were phasing in. You know, they started with uh, specific uh, hours of you know, patient safety. And this year, the CE must be technician specific, T specific. Doesn't mean that it has to be ACPE, but it has to be technician specific. And on our website, it describes the definition of the requirements for that. And then we'll be phasing, uh, reducing the number of hours for college courses, and then eventually phasing out in-service hours. The, the big one that uh, we announced was, beginning in 2020, in order to sit for our exam, you must be a graduate of an, an accredited training program. So there's a, uh, an agreement between ACPE and ASHP that they formed a new commission that will receive this. Now, we understand the challenges behind this because there are areas in the country where there may not be a training program. For example, I think in Iowa, there's not even an accredited training program in Iowa. But a place like North Dakota, where it's very vast, very rural, they actually have this requirement in order to practice as a technician. You must be a graduate of accredited training program. How do they do that? Well, they, they went beyond the traditional brick and mortar example, coming to the to, uh, coming on campus, but said, we can do some sort of hybrid, where you have an online program, and then you can do your, your training at your different sites. So we held a stakeholder meeting in October of last year brought in a lot of uh, folks across the country to get their input because we recognize that you can't wait to 2018 to implement this. So this, this takes time. This is similar to the, to the BS and the farm need degree. You couldn't do that overnight. So this is one that, again, looking forward that uh, we're, we're moving towards. A lot of, again, a lot of talk uh, and, uh, about the education and training. And then finally, we are also uh, working on advanced certification programs. There, there are three programs, three areas. One is in sterile compounding, one in health system pharmacy, and the other in retail. Associated with that, we have task force. I can't tell you today what that program will look like, but the first one that we're working on is on sterile compounding. Or compounding. Our task force will meet in May, and they will begin to define the structure for, for that, what are the requirements in order to be uh, to sit for that, that program. So we'll have more information for you, hopefully, um, in, a, in several months. But it, it takes a while to, to, to develop the programs. Again, it's, it's a recognition of, of where we're we going, and we've had a lot of interest in this. Technicians say, you know, I need to do this, I need to do this, because we now view technician pharmacy not as an occupation, but as a profession for many of us. And so they stay with it. When we look at our average tech, they're, they're young and they're female. But many now are staying, staying with the program because they see this as a, as a good way of life. So the way forward, when we talk about, again, uh, trying to provide and improve patient care and outcomes and access, it's important that we look at the, look at the players that are involved, elevate the standards with the professionals, make sure that they meet the growing demands of the healthcare system. 
because it is changing. It is changing. Whether we want to believe it or not, it is changing. So again, go back to remaining relevant, doing things that we need to do in order to be, I think, competitive to improve outcomes and improve access. If we can show uh, benefit there, progress there, then uh, that helps, I think, reinforce our roles. And for technicians, those roles are expanding. The scope is expanding. And so it, uh, there are examples out there right now where technicians are taking over the order fulfillment piece, the distributed piece. Technicians and farmers are still involved, but they're showing that we can do the, this particular task so that you can focus on other areas of, of pharmacy. However, you can't do that unless you have a technician in force that is educated, trained, and that, that can move along with us. And I'll, I'll share with them um, one specific example. When I was in the Air Force, uh, I was a senior, phar a senior pharmacist, and at one point responsible for 1,100 technicians. And I can tell you right now that, the, that our technicians are the greatest out there in the military, because they, they do, we train them to do a lot. And I know that many folks say, you know, when they, when they retire or they, they separate from, from the service, we want, we want them because they're very competent. And I know that for if we do something very similar across the board, you'll have that same sort of level, you have that same level of competence uh, with, uh, with technicians. So uh, here are the uh, as, a, as a wrap up, what has remained stable in pharmacy professional over the last 10 years? The need for change. <coughs> we have to, I think, we have to be able to, I think, identify what's happening on the horizon and not be reactive, but be proactive. Uh, technicians can assist in all these, these various functions, whether well, supervise other technicians, database manager, overseeing compounding quality control. Which of the following statements are false? All states do not regulate pharmacy technicians. You all went from green, from red to green uh, last year. I, I said, Larry, your job is almost done now. <laughs> <laughs> you should give yourself a hand because that's, uh, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> Because there are, there are a lot of forces out there that don't want to advance. And um, a lot of politics behind that. And so we're very pleased that this happened with, with Michigan. So we have a few more states that are, that are trying to include the District of Columbia. They're, they're getting close. So that begins, I think, once you have that momentum, then you can go on to the, go on to the next step. So again, as, as a wrap up, we talk about technicians. We talk about the, the, the impact. We don't measure it in, in numbers. We measure it in, in what's being done in terms of access to care. Uh, quality, quality of care, Re reducing med errors. Technicians are, are crucial and vital for that process. And so I thank you for your time and I'll entertain questions at the, at the end.
was MSPT informally working on getting technician uh, licensure? Shout it out. Probably about 1985. <laughs> Forever. Forever. Okay. Yeah, they didn't put that in the stat in the legislative history, but we all know that you, you all have been working very hard. Uh, another stat that appeared in the legislative history was the fact that uh, the Controlled Substance Advisory Commission knows that a lot of times when somebody steals controlled substances in a pharmacy setting, it's the technician that's, that's involved with that. And the problem with that, the, the old problem with that was what? There was not a requirement uh, that that theft be reported as to that individual technician because they weren't licensed. Now, sometimes they did get reported to, to a third party vendor. And so if you went from job A in a community pharmacy to a different pharmacy and you didn't bother to tell them that you're a thief, well, uh, now there will be a mechanism to uh, take a look at that. A little bit about the bill itself. It went in uh, to introduction in January of 2013 and it was finally passed through in September of 2014. Originally had an effective date of December 22nd. We're going to hear from Carol in a few minutes about the fact that obviously that's been pushed off uh, to June uh, of this year. Now, that was the formal reasoning. What was the informal, or what this guy believes to be the real reason behind this legislation? Does anybody know what took place in September and October of 2012? Let's hear it. I heard somebody say it. New England Compounding Center. Obviously that was huge nationally and huge in Michigan because of all the problems that, that occurred with all the patients. Uh, and I think that drove both the new compounding law and, of course, the technician law to fruition. Uh, there was also, this is after the fact, but there was also a, a fairly significant Michigan event. No good news is no patients were harmed, but there was a compounding pharmacy that had a contaminant found in, in a uh, sterile product that they manufactured that they compounded. And uh, they had a major consequence uh, because of that. So, what does it mean to be licensed? Well, whether it's Michigan or any other state, license is always viewed by the regulatory agency of the state as a privilege. So there's typically a lot less due process required for somebody regulatory-wise to take that away from you. This statute says that the technician's licensure is a subfield license. So let's talk about that for a second. What does that really mean? It's, it's really, from a legal standpoint, it's, it's just a descriptor. It's an adjective. It just describes that the pharmacist, obviously, is uh, going to be supervising and doing a final check on most of the dispensing activity and the technicians involved in the preparation. It's just setting that out. Does it mean that there's any less or more protections? No, it's just it's a descriptor. It's like in the nursing field. How many levels of nurses are there, right? We have mid-levels, nurse practitioners. We have RNs, we have LPNs, and then we have certified nursing assistants. So below RN, they're all considered to be the same subfield. So it's a descriptor. What does the law specifically say? And we're going to go through this real quick. It allows all the stuff that everybody has been doing for a long time. But the main difference is in case you were allowing technicians to either transfer controlled prescriptions to other pharmacies or talk to physicians' offices and accept verbal orders for uh, controlled substances, it specifically does not allow that. Everything else in traditional is, is written into the law. Now there's a little issue, maybe Carol's going to pick up on this, um, maybe we'll get a question about this, but there's currently, first off, there's no administrative group rules yet that promulgated relative to either the compounding law or the technician law. We expect that they're in the works, or they will be in the works, and we'll get more details on the operational characteristics of these, of these uh, laws probably in the next year or two. 
There's currently a law in the books which allows a pharmacist to delegate, a pharmacy or pharmacist to get, delegate tasks to technicians. This came out, I didn't do the history on this, but I think it's been about 10 years since this, this rule came out. When it first came out, that's when uh, the board inspectors put a new line item on the standard, on the standard um, question that they would ask you when they come in and do an inspection on a report. Do you have a technician policy? And the answer was typically no, because nobody realized that they needed one. Uh, but then they would write one and send it in uh, as part of the process. But this would have allowed or would allow other activities as long as the pharmacy and pharmacist determined that the technician or technicians were qualified to do whatever the task was that they want to delegate to them. Now, I don't have knowledge of anybody going really far with this. Uh, but there's a little discrepancy between the law which says you can do X, Y, and Z, and it spells it out, and this rule which says that you could delegate things maybe beyond what's in the law. I would suggest, as you're going to hear any lawyer say this, I would suggest if you're doing this, you be careful, take a look at what you're doing, and make sure it's in compliance with the law. When you're uh, a licensee, what, what, happens when you apply for a license? Well, they look at a bunch of things. Good moral character. Do you have any convictions out there? Did you, uh, when you submitted your app, did you put any fraudulent or false information in there? And have you had a prior problem? Now, how does this come up? Well, the way this comes up most times that I've seen is that an applicant overlooks something. Oh, yeah, you know, when I was 18 years old, I'm talking about Everett, this is not me. <laughs> when I was 18 years old, I had a little retail theft issue that came up, and because my criminal lawyer said I should just cop the plea and take the, the hit and whatever, I'll do that. Not thinking about a consequence downstream when you're trying to get licensed or when you're reapplying for a license and you fail to disclose it. And of course, they don't find it until something else happens. They find it, then they come back and say, "Aha! You know, we're going to we're going to deny your reapplication." So you want to be upfront with that. Another thing that that licensees are required to do is report things now. So if you're a pharmacy technician, by the way, I meant to do this upfront. How many pharmacy technicians do we have here? A lot. Good. Uh, when you're a licensee, you're required to report other licensees for certain bad conduct. For example, if you're sitting next to, you just should pick on Carol for a minute. If you're sitting next to Carol, and Carol puts a 500 pound bottle of now recently rescheduled hydrocodone product into her purse and walks out the door, uh, don't throw that at me. Uh, walks out the door, and clearly that would be a theft, you are required under the, under the statutes and rules to report that licensee as having done that. There's other, other things that come up in practice, and I, there's one I'll mention. Uh, I don't want to you know, have anybody think that, that no, I'll, I'll stop there. You'll get the point. Uh, let's say you're practicing with somebody who's incompetent or has a serious uh, addiction problem, whether it's a technician or a pharmacist. You really need to think long and hard about reporting that uh, that person because they may be a risk, of, a safety risk for for anybody. Anyway, point here: you've got to report things, criminal convictions, license, self-report, license reactions, other states, uh, etc. This is the application. You'll, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll be seeing it soon. And ask those very questions uh, on the app. And if you have something to say, you should say. It. I was asked to talk about the complaint process, so I'm going to talk about that briefly. There's three basic ways that a licensee in Michigan gets looked into. Uh, one way, which is really straightforward, is, is you have a patient who's unhappy because of uh, an error. Maybe it never even got out the door. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe they brought it to the pharmacy's attention. There's a format on, on the web, on the Michigan.gov, a form they can actually fill out, send in, and the uh, investigation ensues. They're statutorily required to investigate. You can't look at something and say, eh, 
this doesn't look like it's going to amount to anything, so we won't look into it. No, they have to look into it. Many pharmacies receive random, random inspections or inspections for the reasons that can trigger a subsequent investigation. And then the other category refers to a bunch of other opportunities. Uh, maybe the DEA is looking at something, and then they call in the board of pharmacy. Maybe, uh, you know, who knows? There could be another agency involved in, in, a, in a situation with a physician, and then there's a question about a pharmacy. It could be the Department of Justice. Uh, so there's ways that that happens. Once there becomes a need for an investigation, one of the board inspectors comes and looks into things, does interviews of all the interested uh, people, including the pharmacist, and now the local the technician. And they put together a report. That report then goes up the, uh, the chain of, of command in the department, and someone signs off and says, I think this is worthy of a possible complaint. Sometimes the attorney general gets involved in their office, and then they issue an administrative complaint. After that happens, uh, the licensee is entitled to Compliance conference where they sit down with a board of pharmacy disciplinary subcommittee member, maybe their attorney if they are one, uh, and they talk about what happened and they try to resolve it through settlement. Many times that is what happens. Uh, if it doesn't work that way and there's not a settlement, they are entitled to go to an administrative uh, hearing and put on proofs and have an administrative law judge write a formal decision which says what the conduct, what the factual basis for the conduct, and whether or not the ALJ thinks it was a violation of whatever the psychic rule or statute is. And then that goes back to the Board of Pharmacy, and the Board of Pharmacy gets to say, we agree, we disagree, or we agree, disagree with conditions, and they come up with a final decision. There's one item that's not on here, is there is the possibility of appealing that final decision of the Board of Pharmacy Disciplinary Subcommittee to the Michigan Court of Appeals. I've been practicing for 23 years, and I've done that twice. Uh, it's, it's like got about a 0.1% chance of success, because the way the Court of Appeals looks at this, whether it's the Board of Medicine, Pharmacy, Nursing, or whatever, these are the experts. They know what they're doing. Unless there's a huge abuse of discretion, they really blew it. You're not going to get it reversed from the Court of Appeals, so it's pretty rare. I, as a side note, uh, and these things are, are pretty stressful. I put on a hearing on Monday with an ALJ, with, a, with an out-of-state client, on a compounding pharmacy issue, and the uh, <coughs> client did very well. The, the, I think the, the hearing came out well, but it was really stressful. Yesterday, I had two complaints in there, which was with uh, a board member who I don't see in the audience, and I would never acknowledge them even if I did. Uh, and the, the assistant attorney general handles most of the pharmacy cases, and then I had two different sets of clients. And one was compounding related, which was a long conference, but it was very complex. And then one was controlled substance uh, related. So we deal with this uh, all the time. So the next question, Janet, and this is not an advertisement. I'm not <laughs> going to say 1-800-CALL-KIM, right? I'm not saying that. But you really do need to, to question, if you get involved with this administrative law process, you really do need to question, do I need to get a lawyer? And I will tell you what, what I do and what I have my staff do in our firm. I have some people who live with me in, in, in these matters. We tell people, whether, it's, whether I'm speaking to physician groups or nurse groups, other lawyers, I always say this. I say you should contact a lawyer who works in this space, who understands things, and at the very least, consult on the question of do I need a lawyer? And if you feel you need to interview multiple lawyers, you should do that too. You should sit down. It may be that in your situation, you don't need a lawyer. I've told people that. I said, well, at the moment, you know, Ride this out, figure out the answer to this question, and then come back, and, and we can help you if something happens. On the other hand, I have situations where it's clear this is not going to be good for the licensee, and they need to start working on it right up front. So, <clears throat> now for some fun. Question and answer time. Let's go. 
Community pharmacy can, uh, can community pharmacies pull the upfront clerk to help in the pharmacy? The four, what's the answer? Yes. Good. I started with the easy ones. After? No. <coughs> can a compounding pharmacy train anybody to work in a sterile lab? Before? Yes. After? No. Guys are good. A little bit trickier one. Read this carefully. <coughs> Theft of controlled substances by a technician was reportable to Laura, the department. I expected to have both yeses and noes. Now, this is the trick. The theft is reportable. You got to use a DEA 104 or the online version now. But you're required to send a copy of that to work. So the answer is yes, but you don't report the licensee because they want a licensee. Now, obviously, what's the answer after? Yes. Another no brainer, well, I think a no brainer. Um, technicians have to be a good moral character before. No. Technically, no. But, but the, point, the point there is a lot of employers do background, did and do and still will do background checks on potential employees. So if there's something out there and you don't disclose it, they're probably going to play. And of course, after this, technicians, could they be investigated by the department before? Uh, oops. They could be investigated, but the department couldn't take the action. Right? And then of course, after, yes. And, and let me tell you how that would have worked. So let's talk about New England compound here just a second. Does anybody know what really happened? No. But I had a couple of friends on the board, uh, Massachusetts boards, and when, when they, they did their investigation, I was uh, talking with them about what's going on. Here's what happened. They were using a lyophilizer and making methylprednisolone vials. I get that they were uh, specifically to be used for, they were sterile, they were sterile and preservative fruits. So they were to be used intraspinally, as we all know. They were uh, using a, a SOP where they were supposed to autoplay those vials. Once they stopped them, once they clipped, re clipped them and got them ready to go labeled, they were, they were supposed to autoplay them. And they were. They autoclaved them, they were supposed to autoclave them for 20 minutes minimum. For the batch that went out, and, or the batches that went out, somebody was autoclaving them for 15 minutes. Now, what happened? It killed the viruses, it killed the bacteria, it didn't kill the fungal spores. And so the, that whole, and, and I've not seen or heard what person or persons made that decision to go down to 15 minutes for whatever reason. But had it been a technician, obviously we'd be here. Well, we haven't heard who made the decision or who's doing the operation, and we maybe never will. But in Michigan, clearly, if it was a technician that made a decision, it would be uh, license gone. Okay, one more question. Malpractice before, malpractice after. Here's how that works. You, to be sued individually in a malpractice case in Michigan, you have to, you have to be a licensed health care professional. Uh, so if you're an unlicensed health care professional and something happens on your watch, you can be sued potentially, but it wouldn't be under the malpractice ban. Uh, with technicians now being officially licensed, it's possible. Do I think that's going to happen? Very rarely. Extremely rare circumstance where they would become the target of a malpractice case. Very, very unlikely. Uh, you know the answer to this. It is no. Yes, but again, I mentioned. I, I believe that a lot of uh, 
employers do background checks, and so if there's something out there they would know. Do technicians need to self-report any uh, alcohol or drug-related convictions before? After? Uh, and of course, to follow that up, I have to mention this. HPRP, Health Professionals Recovery Program, before? After? Before? After? Uh, another trick question. Before? After? So, the trick part of this is if the pharmacist had some controlled substance related issue and received discipline or criminal conviction related to that, there are, in the uh, Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, the 21 CFRs, there are prohibitions for someone who had that background from working in a pharmacy in any capacity. And a couple quickies. Do technicians now need to consider purchasing malpractice or licensure insurance? Well, I always say this, whether it's physician groups, well, no, I take that back, physicians are different, but I always say this for non-physician groups, it's a business decision. Does the employer have coverage for you as an employee? Like 99.9% .9 of the time the answer to that is yes, you should verify that. Will that policy that they purchase uh, for the pharmacy or the hospital or the whatever uh, entity, should it cover you? Yes, as long as you're working within the scope of your employment. If you punch out Everett because you don't like him, he's your patient, are you going to get in trouble? Yeah, was that, was that within the scope of your employment? No. Um, so the answer to this question is business-related, risk-related, and they, I'm sure that there, there will be policies available if you wish, and I'm sure that they will be relatively inexpensive. And the other thing that happens if you get sucked into some sort of a, a case and you're working through your employer's insurance company, they get to drive the boat. You are a passenger in the boat. So if there's this going on, it wasn't me, it was a pharmacist. No, it wasn't me, it was a technician. And there can be some adversity. And the last thing I want to comment on is this question. What do you think? Can technicians be held responsible for an error after the pharmacist signs off on their work? Well, that's kind of why I'm here. Talk about this question. It, it may well depend on what arena we're, we're in. Are we talking about criminal? Are we talking about licensure? Are we talking about civil, IT malpractice? And regardless of which venue we're talking about, the answer to that question is a qualified yes. If you're a licensee, even if, let's, let's say there was a huge error that occurred. Let's make one up. Let's say that the heparin that went into an IV was 10 times what it was supposed to be. It was due to an, an error that, the, that the, the technician that was doing the compounding of the work put it in. It wasn't detected by either the technician or the pharmacist. It went out and unfortunately, what happens when you give somebody 10 times more heparin than they need? They die, or they may die. So, you know, that'd be a serious situation. Could somebody, come after both the pharmacist and the technician, whether it's licensure, criminal, or malpractice. Yeah. And Carol is up. Oh, I want to, sorry, Carol's not quite up. I want to say one more thing. Thank you again, Larry, Diane, for the invitation to come here. I love coming and speak in front of pharmacy groups. Uh, I like to see all my friends that uh, I've known for years. I unfortunately have a trial starting next week, and I will not be staying after, well, I'll be staying for a little while after this, but I will not be able to stay the rest of the day or tomorrow, which I hoped. So uh, if I get a chance to see any friends, I, I, or not see any friends, uh, my apologies, I wish I could. Thank you.
for inviting the department to come and speak to you today. I really appreciate that uh, opportunity. And I also want to take the moment to welcome Everett to our great state of Michigan. <laughs> it's cold, but we are hearty. I see a car heart out there and a couple other things. We, we will bundle up. Um, let me make sure I know how to use this first. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, the license type. Uh, and I want to also thank the panel members because they covered a lot of the things um, that are important to us um, in the state. But there are three types of licenses. Um, let me ask the question how many people are currently licensed as pharmacy technicians? It's gone through the process. Thank you. How many people still need to be licensed? Thank you. So hopefully it will help you get through uh, this process and you'll find uh, this information helpful. Um, as of February 25th, we had many more full license applications coming in than we have limited. And we've also issued uh, some temporary licenses. Let's talk a little bit about the full license. Completing the application, we'll talk about that um, in a minute. <coughs> that we might have in getting that. <coughs> Proof of your high school or GED, and passing the examination. Now, one of the things I think that like uh, applicants are thinking is, okay, if I give the state the PTCB uh, <coughs> certification, that's good. And the law actually is asking for your exam results. So we have partnered with uh, PCCB along with uh, the National Health Career Association in getting that information for the applicant. The limited license um, is not, does not require the exam, and as long as you are working with uh, and currently employed, your employer will fill out the employment verification form. And just note that the limited license is only valid as long as you remain employed with that pharmacy. Yeah. Well, there, those are going to be the uh, rules and, and issues that are going to have to be uh, dealt with. The rule or the statute doesn't actually address that specific issue. Um, another issue. Yes. We, we didn't hear what the issue was. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? I asked if the pharmacy was transferred. Yeah. Another owner sold. So yeah. she asked if it, if it was transferred or sold. Does that still cover the the pharmacy technician? And although we have not dealt with that particular situation, the statute doesn't address that we may have to look at, at the rules and then make a determination. So we have many things uh, that the state government needs to take a look at and, and questions like that. Um, I know one of the other issues is if you're employed at one particular pharmacy, but um, assigned to various locations. So what we've told people is if you are um, assigned to various locations, the law says as of December 22nd, you have to, your employer has to list um, all of the locations. So we are allowing multiple locations, um, but we do have to have the documentation for that. And of course, the temporary is there for uh, applicant, uh, applicants who are going to take the exam. And it is a limited time frame. It's a 220, or I'm sorry, 210 days, and it cannot be renewed. Now, Kim kind of went through some of the ethical disclosures, and so I'm just listing those. I won't go through them uh, one by one. But we also ask on the application various questions, including the felony conviction, whether or not you've been fined or disciplined by a similar board um, in another state or province, whether there's any censure and treatment of any substance abuse in the last two years. One of the things I think Kim also mentioned. 
mentioned is disclosure. If you have checked yes to any of those questions, provide us with a written upfront. Give us court documents, um, your explanation. If you do that up front, it'll, the processing time um, will be a, a lot faster because we will have to stop the process, send a letter out to you, and ask you to explain. And we also talked briefly about the criminal background check. That's also a requirement. So let's talk a little bit about that. It's mandatory for all new applicants. Um, let's see, have fingerprints taken about five days before submitting your application. This helps us if you do it too early. Um, it's difficult for us to actually match the information. This information comes from the state police. The state police actually has 30 days to provide this information to the department, uh, but they're usually pretty good about getting that information to us. And then we're going through a little bit of the information that's on the application. It'll give you specific information on how to obtain your fingerprints. And of course, we review any hits that we receive. So what should you know? I can't go over this enough. Please, please, please look over your application. Make sure you sign it and make sure it's complete. You, you wouldn't believe how many applications we get that are missing information. And that delays the problem. Um, also know what type of application are you applying for? Are you, have you taken the exam and you can uh, apply for the full? Uh, right now we're getting uh, applications, uh, double the application. Uh, technicians are filing for a limited and they're filing for a full. So take a look at why you're applying and file the one application. Of course, the fingerprint is required. And if you are licensed in any other state uh, or province, you must <coughs> provide the certification from that licensure board, that state actually has to send it to us. We do not accept uh, application or license uh, copies of license. If I had to go back to my high school and get my diploma, I mean, that is so long ago. But here's what you can do. On the application, there's instructions. And there is a service uh, where you can do a Michigan e-transcript. <coughs> so that's just information. Now, the e-transcripts, so if you've contacted this uh, organization, they are able to send it to our uh, BHCS data at michigan.gov. <coughs> Applicants cannot send their transcripts, but the service can be done. So let's talk a little bit about factors. Of course, the deadline has been changed. I, there should be some applause for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we got the phone call, so we know. Um, but we are going to get a volume of applications coming in, and uh, the timeliness of the educational institutions or the examination agencies, the information that we have to get from a third party will take some time. So keep that in mind. Um, and also pulling together that uh, fingerprint background check. So I can't again express the importance of don't wait until the last minute. Get your application in now. We process over 24 different Boards. We have about 151 license types uh, to issue, so uh, we would like to make sure that we get the start on as soon as possible. And so I know there was an issue during renewal. Uh, people were upset because they got a short uh, license, but the advantage of that is that the people who filed now will have a two-year license and they are sure to be licensed um, moving forward. So causes for the process, delays, wrong fee submitted. Now I have to say, we are working on our forms. I understand that when you tab through the form, it's going all over and not in a sequential
financial uh, situation. And we have a drop down box on our pharmacy applications, the pharmacist, all of our forms have it, this drop down box. We are working very hard and diligently in changing that back to our old system, which was just a check box. <coughs> what happens with the drop down box, I think, is when the pharmacies are trying to help their employees, they print it out. It has that first line, and it doesn't drop down to say, is it a full, is it a temporary, is it a limited, and people are applying for the wrong license type. Uh, again, applications not completed, they didn't check the disclosure questions, they didn't sign the application. Uh, documents that are received under a different name, the transcript. <coughs> Send us a note with your application. Say, here's my maiden name. There may be other documents that come in under this name. So helpful information, uh, you can visit our website for the forms and instructions. And there's also a check on the application status. We would be happy for you to give us a call. Um, we also have our email address online. Uh, we want to help you in any way. Uh, I thought about starting off by saying, you know, I'm from state government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> People go, okay. But uh, truly, truly, uh, we have a great staff. Uh, we work with many different boards and we are here to help you and try to get through this process. It, I know it's going to be challenging, um, both for the pharmacies that are trying to help their employees and the technicians. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call. We will do everything we can to get you through uh, the application process. If you have suggestions, feel free to use that email and say, you know, I went through the process and here's, here's what I suggest. Uh, we're always looking for uh, ways to improve our forms, uh, information that we have out there. So thank you very much for the opportunity and we want to make sure we have time for questions.
So, it is, and, and typically what happens is there needs to be an interpretation or rule by the department uh, or the AG to, to uh, clarify that. But from my perspective, delivering uh, isn't part of the dispensing process. It's simply delivering. But again, I believe uh, what we'll see is uh, additional clarification come out on, on the specifics. And when might that clarification occur? We've got dozens and dozens of, of staff that we have to decide what to do with. And if you if we wait until you get around to providing guidance, what are we going to tell in this room? We've got hundreds of employees that are in limbo right now. What tasks can they do? What can we do to keep serving our patients yet not fall on the wrong side of the, of the yet to be written statute? You, you really need to, to come together and provide some direct guidance before you roll this whole thing out. Well, again, that was the legislature that decided to use those terms, and it's the department who <coughs> will have to move forward to pull together the program. So I agree with you, there needs to be clarification, and all I can do is advise you, again, I can't advise as legal counsel, um, or provide you with any legal uh, advice, but as a regulator, I would err on the side of caution. All right, thank you. Next question is, under a temporary license, a technician can continue to be employed. Can it, First, can a technician continue to be employed after 210 days while they're applying for their full pharmacy license? And then secondly, when they apply for the full license, will they have to repeat the fingerprinting and background check procedure? When there's a different license type, yes, you do have to, it, it's the initial application. So if you apply for the temporary and you have the temporary for 210 days, it's no longer valid after that point. If you apply for the full license, after the temporary license has expired, during that time period, you are not licensed. Okay, did that answer the question? Yes, okay. and the background check? And you are required to, as soon as you file for that new application type, you are required to submit fingerprints. Thank you. All right, next question, and uh, this can be a two-parter, and perhaps we can get Everett in the game here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, under the law, one of the provisions for certifying your technicians is to generate a, an employer-based program that is approved by the Board of Pharmacy. I read you also mentioned that PTCB is looking at, in order for them to sit for their certification exam, having, their, uh, having to have gone through a program that is ACPE or slash ASHP accredited. What does that process look like in order to have those programs approved? Are, are you talking about the employer-based exam? Yes. yes. Um, that is another area that will have to be, it, the language in the statute indicates that it is as approved by the board. So the board will have to decide what criteria and that will be done through the rules. And I do want to mention, it, it does sound very bureaucratic, but to promulgate rules, at a minimum, it takes us about 18 months. Uh, we are working very diligently. Uh, there's one agency through the state that all of the departments must go through for the rulemaking process. And uh, we are working with uh, that agency to try to expedite our particular department rules. And then Everett, what can you tell us as far as being ASHP accredited? The standards for accreditation are, are published on the, the SHP website. Um, and so if there's questions about what's, what's required for meeting those, those um, the standards, they're there. Thank you. I have, a, I have another one. We have probably time for two more questions. Uh, for this one's also for Everett. With licensure being mandatory in Michigan, what do you see as the continued value of maintaining your certification for an organization like PTCB after you've been licensed, even though maintaining that certification is not required for maintenance of the licensure? 
Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, certification, you know, you have your new license in the state, but uh, for some reason, if you move away from the state, uh, you will go work someplace else, they may require that you be certified. Uh, and if you don't have the certification, then you have to start that process over again. So certification and licensure, I see those kind of going go hand in hand, and that I that there are similar requirements, which also speaks to, to the status. Employers will look at that and say, hey, you're certified, then uh, we may uh, provide you a bump in your salary. Thank you. And then the last one we're going to give to Kim, because I feel like he's been neglected here. <laughs> Can you give us any examples of mandatory reporting for criminal activity other than those you went over related to that? Sure. The, probably the big one uh, is health care fraud. So, you know, the, the uh, Michigan Attorney General and the Department of Justice have been pretty active in looking into health care fraud. And you are all aware of some very high profile cases where physicians, pharmacies, pharmacists, etc., have done some crazy things and, and uh, for example, dispensed drugs that weren't, uh, well, processed uh, drugs and billed insurance entities or the, the federal government and the drugs were never uh, given to the patients because they didn't need them. You know, things like that have happened. So it's, it's really, it, from what I've seen, it's uh, healthcare fraud is the next big enchilada. So it's either driven by a insurance entity that reports to an individual. So if you're undergoing an audit and they report there's fraud related to the audit or if you're involved with uh, some criminal activity, that would be important. Thank you. All right, that, that is all the time we have. For those of you who submitted questions with your uh, email address for um, myself or the panels or I'm not getting those answers out to you, uh, so please give, give me, help me thank Aaron McAllister and General